Good morning or afternoon or what time it is in your time zone. It's Ron Brown. I'll be your host today. Tech for Senior. It is episode 135. It's Halloween, October the 31st. So welcome everyone. Uh, today we uh, have a, a big show for you for this next hour. We'll start with uh, Bob's security news update. Uh, we are then going to have a special guest talk about EV cars. What are they? Part one by Mike Ungerman. Uh, Bob's going to tell us what happens af after you die to your Facebook account. And I'm going to give you an update on the Instant Ink program I've been working with. And Ray's, uh, oh, and um, Huey's going to tell you how to identify hoaxes. And then, of course, Ray has uh, a music outro. We'll see who died this week. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, and then we'll have a Q and A, and uh, get on with the show. So that's great. Now we also at the end we have, of course, our premiere service, and on the premiere service today, and I sent the email out uh, on our Saturday newsletter for the link, and I'll put the link in the uh, um, in the chat. But today on uh, the premiere service. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, three things, uh, cars and trucks. And Dewey Kloos uh, talked about that uh, uh, about a year ago. And Dewey is here. He's going to give us an update on how he's doing before he heads to Arizona. Uh, and I'm going to talk about saving your precious moments. And then uh, Huey's going to talk on files and formats. So three three popular topics today on uh, on our premier service. Um, as you know, um, Dewey Kloos and of course Joanne are good friends of, of mine and, and of course everybody here and uh, Dewey did uh, a, a number of presentations for us this past year. He retired. Uh, this is about the time when uh, they head down to Arizona and of course at Silver Ridge is where I was for 10 years and that's where I got to know uh, Dewey. So he's he's heading down there. And I sent him an email uh, on the weekend and said, how the heck are you doing? Why don't you come on the show and give us a little update on how you and Joanne are doing? And so I think you're here, aren't you, Dewey? Yes, I am. Can you give us a little? Now, Joanne, only he only gets three minutes. Sorry to say, first of all, that my sweet Joanne has got another obligation with an appointment that she's just left for, so she is not here. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, let's, I guess, first of all, most of you know I had a stroke 18 months ago. And uh, from a worldview, a stroke's trajectory is generally downward. However, there are ups and downs within that trajectory. And at the current time, I'm experiencing a few absolutely phenomenal ups, but there are plenty of downs. It just takes longer for me to get everything done every day for my, whether it's personal care, things around the house, helping in the yard, jumping on my John Deere, and I don't jump on anything, but getting on my John Deere tractor lawnmower to mulch leaves at this time of the year, you see beautiful leaves in the background. Most of those are, have fallen off the tree. Well, anyway, um, from overall, I'm feeling really good. My mind, the great thing is my mind is good. The bad thing is I'm so darn busy with so much going on that I don't know whether I'm coming or going in time. I feel times. I feel like I'm a juggler with a half dozen balls in the air. For one thing, they're doing a major street rebuild on our street, a once every 50 year rebuild. And that has just kept me intensely busy. My front yard has changed dramatically. The street outside our house is narrowed from 43 feet concrete to 26 foot asphalt. These are huge changes. But anyway, we're doing the best we can. Uh, I'm not sure what else to tell you. Perhaps you can might want to fire a question or two. Nope. Uh, when are you going down to Mesa? Oh, yes. We're going to be flying down on uh, Thursday evening, December 1. Our wonderful daughter and son-in-law will be driving our car, fully loaded car down, and we'll arrive the next day on December 2nd with all of our things and will help us get settled. But this will be our final year at Silveridge. We, we have made a decision that we, we need to bring that part of our 
wonderful life to an end because the certain is simply, or the, what well, shall we say, the future is certainly has its uncertainties. And like I've often said, one bad fall, I could be dead in hours. It's, that's, the, that's the big problem. When you, when you have bad balance and a stroke and you're physically limited, it's a problem. But we're going to try to enjoy the entire season at Silveridge. When we come back, it will be our last time. And whatever remaining time we have left, we'll enjoy in Minnesota, even in winter. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the thanks for the update. Huey, uh, we had a busy week last week. Yes, uh, we had the uh, learning Chromebooks as well as the normal things that we have. Right. Uh, happy Halloween, by the way, to everybody. And uh, <laughs> I've got my my costume on for tonight. you have a costume on really yeah can't you see it yeah of course <laughs> uh and uh this wednesday uh i, I always mc the uh uh stug or sarasota uh, uh technology user group uh meetings and uh the first it's always the first wednesday of the month which is this wednesday and mark shulman is going to be talking about uh backups in a busy world and uh that should be interesting. If you are registered for that meeting, uh, by all means, uh, feel free to attend. It is open uh, uh, to non-members as well as to members. Great. What's the link? Will you put the link in the in the chat? Yeah, I'll have to go get it. You have to register. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, Bob, you had a busy... So that tower is almost done? No, but it's supposed to be erected probably next week. Okay. And then we have to wait for the electric company. You know, it's it's waiting for one after the other after the other. But progress does happen. Hopefully I'm still alive once it's finally in operation. <laughs> hey, you know, you should take some pictures of the tower and show us, oh, show us I've, next week. I've got all kinds of pictures from the day they broke ground. And now the next step will be for the tower actually to go actually up. Actually go up. Okay, good. Yep. All right. And Ray. <clears throat> Hello. How are we doing? Great balls of fire. Well, next week. That's next week. <laughs> today, the music I for today will be somebody who's very much alive. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Is Bill here? I don't oh. think Bill Bill no. I, Bill hasn't arrived yet. And of course, I'll uh, I'll uh, introduce Mike Hungerman in a moment uh, before his session. All right. Uh, let's take it away, Bob. Ready. If you find this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending October 28, 2022. Chrome extensions with 1 million installs hijack targets browsers. Researchers at Guardio Labs have discovered a new malvertising campaign pushing Google Chrome extensions that hijack searches and insert affiliate links into web pages. Because all these extensions offer color customization option and arrive on the victim's machine with no malicious code to evade detection, the analyst named the campaign Dormant Colors. According to the Guardio report, by mid-October 2022, 30 variants of the browser extensions were available on both the Chrome and the Edge web stores, amassing over a million installs. The infection begins with advertisements or redirects when visiting web pages that offer a video or download. However, when attempting to download the program or watch the video, you are redirected to another site stating you must install an extension to continue. See more at Bleeping Computer. Hear ye, hear ye on Parlor. Parliament Technologies put out a press release this week that stated it had entered into an agreement in principle to sell Kanye West, now legally known as Ye, the conservative social media platform Parler. The announcement comes just days after Ye was banned by both Instagram and Twitter for anti-Semitic comments. 
According to the press release, Ye has become the richest black man in history through music and apparel and is taking a bold stance against the recent censorship from big tech, using his far-reaching talents to further lead the fight to create a truly non-cancelable environment. As of this week, Ye himself still has less than 16,000 followers on Parlor. For more on this story, see The Verge. 31 Arrested for Hacking Keyless Vehicles Software developers, car thieves, and resellers were among those arrested for taking part in a car theft ring that hacked into keyless vehicles and stole them without needing to use the physical key fob. The takedown was coordinated by French authorities with help from their Latvian and Spanish counterparts and Europol. 22 locations were searched and over a million euros in criminal assets were seized. The ring targeted keyless vehicles made by two French car manufacturers. The criminals used a hacking tool to open the car doors and start the ignition. See the full Europol announcement for more. Industrial cybersecurity about to take off. Market research companies do not all agree on how much value the industrial cybersecurity market will have in a decade's time, but they do all agree that it will experience a steady growth. The market is currently valued at 20 billion, and some researchers predict that it will exceed 40 billion by 2030. Industrial cybersecurity solutions are increasingly needed as more organizations and governments rely on IT and cloud technologies and more threat actors target those organizations and governments. Network security is expected to dominate the market but cloud security will see the most growth. To learn more see Security Week. The FBI warns of disinformation ahead of midterms. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency issued two public service announcements this month to address concerns surrounding the midterm elections in November. The first PSA is more of an assurance to the public that U.S. voting infrastructure is sound. It reports that any attackers' attempts to compromise the election will unlikely succeed. In contrast, the second PSA cautions the public against disinformation that may try to undermine voter confidence through false claims of voter suppression, voter or ballot fraud, and cyber attacks on election infrastructure. For more, see CSO. New York Post says website hack was rogue employee. The New York Post, one of the biggest New York City daily newspapers, said it was hacked on Thursday after several offensive articles and tweets were published to the newspaper's website and Twitter account. The articles and tweets, which were racist and sexually violent in nature, were polled a short time later. Iva Benson, a spokesperson for News Corp, which owns the New York Post, told TechCrunch, confirming that the post was hacked. The vile and reprehensible content posted has been removed and we're still investigating the cause. Later, the spokesperson claimed an employee was to blame for the unauthorized conduct, but declined to say what evidence the newspaper had to show that the employee was to blame. Read more at TechCrunch. It's official. There's a new chief twit. It's for real this time. After months of legal drama, bad names, and will they or won't they chaos to put your favorite rom-com to shame, Elon Musk has closed his $44 billion acquisition of Twitter. Musk sealed the deal Thursday night, taking Twitter private and ousting a handful of top executives in the process. See more at TechCrunch. This week's must read on the Avast blog. There are steps you can take to create and manage strong passwords for children without losing your mind in the process. Here's what Avast recommends. Just follow the article at the link listed. Since it's almost Halloween, you should know in Alabama 
wearing a nun or priest costume for Halloween is illegal. Once caught dressed up as these religious figures, violators may be charged with a $500 fine as well as a year in prison. Just thought you might want to know. That wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Bob. You're not dressed up as a priest. No, I couldn't find that costume. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for the update. All right. Now we're going to move on to a popular uh, series now we're starting. And this, of course, is going to be on uh, EV cars. We uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike Ungerman, for doing this. Uh, we're going to have a series of these uh, out for you. Uh, I think as we move into 2023, uh, you'll see that uh, this is something we're going to need to talk about more and more. Uh, and Mike, of course, uh, I was quite surprised uh, uh, on our survey uh, that Mike did, and it really showed quite a bit of interest in, in cars. And a lot of people have EV cars, which is 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 totally different than a year ago when I when I put um, asked everyone if they had an EV car and only got, I think, one response. So uh, big changes occurring. So I thought we, we needed some education on this. So thank you, Mike, for doing that. So let's see what Mike has to say. This is on uh, what is an EV car? Let me share the screen. Hi, I'm Mike Ungerman of the Central Florida Computer Society. I have previously presented on solar PV systems for the production of electrical energy. Today, I'm starting a series on electric vehicles, which for me is a natural follow-on to my previous presentations. In 2017, I installed my first phase of a solar PV system on my home. And that fall, I attended Orlando's International Auto Show looking for a potential replacement of my five-year-old car, a Hyundai Tucson. While at the show, Kia was promoting their about to be released 2018 Kia Nero plug-in hybrid. It seemed to me that it would be a natural match for my solar PV system in that I could produce electricity to charge its battery on sunny days and essentially drive it for free for the first 26 miles of pure EV power before it would switch into a hybrid mode. I placed my order in December and picked it up in February of 2018. We'll talk more about this car in later presentations. I think the best way to start our series is to learn about the three types of electric vehicles, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and full EV. Dan, Dan Edmonds of Edmonds Cars YouTube channel has given us permission to play his very good video on this subject. So, on with the show. As new technologies continually emerge, car makers sometimes struggle to explain their newest products. Lately, it has become apparent that some consumers are confused about the difference between hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and electric vehicles. Surveys have shown that some consumers think that they all require a certain amount of gasoline, while others worry that the move towards 100% electrification means the end of the gasoline engine and the freedom of movement that comes with it. On top of that, car makers don't always market them consistently, which only adds to the confusion. So I'm going to try to untangle all of that for you. We'll start with the basics and build up from there. What is meant by electrification? Electrification just means some degree of electric drive. Of course, that includes electric vehicles which have no gasoline engine, but it also means part-time EVs such as plug-in hybrids and regular gasoline hybrids that you can't plug in. Charge points aren't as common as gas stations, so range is important. But it's not the big number that catches your eye on the window sticker. We're familiar with MPG and what it means to a gasoline vehicle. But the window stickers of electric cars and plug-in hybrids has something called MPGE. But MPGE isn't what you think it is. It's an attempt by engineers to equate the fuel efficiency in terms we can all understand, but I think it also gives some people the false impression that 
electric cars somehow use gasoline. A terrible cost yardstick because the prices of gasoline and electricity are not related in this way. Ignore it. It's best to focus on kilowatt hours because that's what you're buying. The rating is right there on the window sticker, kilowatt hours per 100 miles. That's the efficiency number you should be looking at when you shop for an electric vehicle. So what's a kilowatt hour? It's a quantity of electricity. But to understand a kilowatt hour, you first have to understand a kilowatt. And guess what? You already do. Let's have a look at this light bulb. It's rated at 100 watts, says so right at the top. That's its brightness. It's power output if I were to turn it on. Incidentally, the W in Watt is capitalized because it stands for James Watt, a <laughs> Scottish inventor. Now let's imagine we have 10 of these 100 watt bulbs turned on all around the house. 10 times 100 is 1,000 watts. Kilo stands for 1,000, so that's one kilowatt. If we leave them on for an hour, we get one kilowatt times one hour, which is one kilowatt hour. And because of the time element, we're now talking about an amount of electricity. And it's not kilowatt per hour, it's kilowatt hour. It's multiplication, not division. Now let's take the idea of a kilowatt hour and apply it to cars. It's an amount of electricity that you use, but it's also an amount you can store. The battery size of an electrified car is measured in kilowatt hours. Think of it like gallons in a gas tank. But don't dwell on gallons any more than that. We need to stay focused on kilowatt hours. Why? Because electricity is sold in kilowatt hours. Look, it's right here on my bill. I pay 25 cents per kilowatt hour when I plug in my electric car. Now, we all know that if you drive a regular car around like a maniac, we'll use more gasoline because we're asking the engine to develop more horsepower. Well, the same is true with electrified vehicles, except this time our lead-footed behavior is draining more kilowatt hours out of the battery pack, and that reduces range and costs money. All right, so now we know a little bit more about electrified car batteries, and the main bit we know is the amount of energy they can hold is measured in kilowatt hours and what that term means. So now we can talk about the three main types of electrified vehicles. Hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are in the spotlight these days, so I'll start with them. When we say electric vehicles, we mean all electric vehicles, or EVs for short. They are technically known as battery electric vehicles, BEV, so your geekier EV-owning friends might call them BEVs. Here there's no engine, no gas tank. They use zero gasoline and have no tailpipe. EVs have large electric motors because they are the sole source of propulsion. And their batteries are large, so big in fact that they usually form a layer under the entire floor of the car. Their storage capacity ranges from 32 to over 100 kilowatt hours depending on the model and how much you're willing to pay. Like any other vehicle, consumption varies by size and type. The most efficient EVs are rated to use about 25 kilowatt hours per 100 miles, while heavier and sportier models are in the mid to high 40 kilowatt hour per 100 mile range. And contrary to NPG, lower is better here because this is a consumption rating. Use less, pay less. Say you drive 12,000 miles a year. That's 1,000 miles a month. If your car is rated to use 26 kilowatt hours every 100 miles, simply multiply by 10 to get 260 kilowatt hours for 1,000 miles. In my case, I'd multiply that by 25 cents per kilowatt hour and get $65 per month for fuel. Range is overhyped. Few, if any of us, drive 300 miles in a day. And for those who do, well, an EV probably isn't the right solution. If you can plug in every night, well, it's better to think about how many miles you drive in a day, not a week. In my own experience, 100 miles is fine. And I think that's true, especially if you have a second vehicle to use on longer trips. OK, maybe you want 150 or 200 miles because you like to take weekend trips. I get it. But don't overbuy 
batteries cost more, weigh more, they take up space. Buying too much could be a barrier to entry that you don't need to really worry about. So-called DC fast charging can become important if you do opt for more range, and most current EVs can support it. It's mainly only necessary if you'll take the car on long journeys, though, and your route will generally be confined to where the networks go. But honestly, anything with over 100 miles of range is going to be comfortable to all but the most lead-butt road warriors. Daily charging is where it's at, and that's typically done at home while you're asleep. The car's included cord will have a 120 volt plug that's designed for a household socket, but that's not fast enough if you're going to drive more than 30 miles a day. In that case, a 240 volt home charging station is the way to go, because it's significantly faster. You'll have to have an electrician install one, but it's a worthwhile expense. EVs are best for people who are homeowners, the household has more than one car, and they have consistent access to a 240 volt home charger if you drive more than 30 miles per day. But maybe you're not sure you can plug in every day. Maybe you'll only have one car. Perhaps you like to take spontaneous road trips. You should consider a plug-in hybrid or PHEV, a part-time EV that is initially powered by its electric motor and battery but also has a gasoline engine and a gas tank. You fuel them up two ways. You plug them in and you gas them up. PHEVs have medium-sized plug-in batteries that enable them to operate as electric vehicles for 17 to 53 miles. And when the juice runs out, the gasoline engine comes on automatically and powers the car like a regular gasoline hybrid. Now, some of them will turn the gasoline engine on even if the battery is full if you floor it to give you a little extra acceleration but that's far from universal their window stickers contain two ratings on the left electric range in miles and consumption in kilowatt hours per 100 miles on the right the familiar mpg on gasoline the electric side will also have an mpg e rating but again that's a useless number you're buying kilowatt hours when you're plugged in Statistically, you probably drive less than 30 miles in a day. In that case, if you plug in nightly and have that sort of commute, you might not buy gas for weeks or even months. Longer commute, road trip, no problem. The gasoline engine will keep you moving. So how much smaller is the battery of a PHEV compared to an EV? Well, it varies along with range, but the biggest ones measure about 16 kilowatt hours. Why 16 kilowatt hours? That's what it takes to qualify for the maximum amount of the $7,500 federal tax credit. PHEVs with smaller batteries qualify for less. Examples with 16 kilowatt hour batteries include the Honda Clarity PHEV, good for 48 miles, the Chrysler Pacifica hybrid minivan, which is in fact a plug-in hybrid that is confusingly marketed, is good for 32 miles because it's bigger and heavier. PHEVs with batteries smaller than 16 kilowatt hours include the plug-in Prius called the Prius Prime, a made up marketing term, but I guess you could say that you're priming the battery by charging it. There's also the Subaru Crosstrek hybrid, which is another example of a badly termed plug-in hybrid. PHEVs are best for people who are homeowners with one car, have consistent access to a charger at home or work, but not necessarily 240 volts, want an EV but don't want to be limited by range concerns. Hybrids have been around the longest. They're known as hybrid electric vehicles or HEVs for short, and right there the electric part is what gets some people confused. Huh? Basically, any true hybrid is 100% gasoline fueled, and by that I mean you can't plug them in. Their window stickers have regular MPG on them. Yes, sometimes they're driven by electricity, but other times they're driven by gasoline, and oftentimes it's both. So they have a gasoline engine, an electric motor, a clever transmission that can combine the two, and a battery. Where does the electricity for that battery come from, you might ask? From braking, mainly. 
and to a lesser extent by siphoning off a little excess power from the engine while it's driving the car. Hybrids are electricity scavengers. The braking bit is called regenerative braking, and that's a key feature that all three types of electrified cars share. Basically, the electric motor becomes a generator by working in reverse, so to speak, when you press on the brake. The generated power is transferred to a dedicated battery, but that battery doesn't need to be big because it only has to hold the electricity that comes from a few city stops. So a typical Prius battery is only one kilowatt hour big, maybe less. A Prius can achieve over 50 miles per gallon in the city because the kinetic energy that is normally wasted as heat in the brakes is recovered, saved in the battery, and then used to get the car moving again and delay the ignition of the gasoline engine every time you leave a stoplight. Now, some hybrids choose to use their stored energy for performance instead of outright fuel economy. The Acura NSX comes to mind. Even Formula One race cars and Le Mans prototypes. Such cars are still hybrids, and they still count as electrified vehicles. But, and this is important, true hybrids have no rating for electric range. If they did, it would be measured in yards, not miles. Don't let them run out of gasoline, in other words. In this respect, they're just like any other normal vehicle. HEVs are best for people who live in apartments, want high gas mileage or a low carbon footprint, but don't have consistent access to a charger or don't want the hassle. So there you have it. Electrification doesn't mean the end of gasoline engines. It simply means a wider range of choices. At the one extreme, we have EVs, which are 100% electric. But at the other, we have pure gasoline-fueled hybrids that recycle normally wasted energy to reduce their use of gasoline, or in some cases, to go faster. In the middle, we have plug-in hybrids, which act as EVs around town, but can use gasoline for longer trips. Among these three choices, there's an electrified vehicle for everyone. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. So I want to thank Dan Edmonds for his excellent video. It's touched on more than just the three types of EVs, including a lot of the basics for the technology behind how they function and what to look for when researching an EV. Many factors will go into decision on whether to obtain an EV, some of them shown here. In future episodes, we'll investigate these factors and the technology behind them. Well, thank you, Mike. That was very interesting. Well done. It was a good, uh, for sure, a very good video. Um, uh, excellent, excellent, excellent. Worth uh, keeping the reference for this. If anybody's going to buy one in the future, go back and review everything that Dan said. Right, right. And of course, we record this, and this is this will be up uh, as part of our episode uh, 135 today. Bob, are you ready to tell us what happens when we die? Have you ever wondered what happens to your Facebook account when you pass away? We leave a huge digital footprint on Facebook. Did you ever think about what will happen with your data when you pass away? Facebook is an important part of a human's life events. We announce the most important milestones on our timelines by sharing with our Facebook friends the joy of getting married, having babies, or moving abroad. But what will happen with all that data when we pass away? Discussing your digital legacy isn't pleasant, but it's an important part of our reality. Don't leave it up to your family members, friends, or even worse, Facebook itself. In this article, I'll guide you through all the options you have so you can make a conscientious decision about your data using the tools that Facebook offers to its users. My thanks to Julia Jemanska for her excellent article on this topic, which was the inspiration for this video. You'll find her article at the link listed. If you find this video helpful, don't forget to like share, subscribe, and get involved. You need to decide what to do with your Facebook data. In short, you have two options, to delete your account or agree to memorialize your person within the social network.
In case you decide on the second option, it's recommended to set up a legacy contact, which is a person who will take care of your account if something happens to you. Your first option is to delete your Facebook account. Deleting a Facebook account is the easier and more radical option. All your data, pictures, posts, comments, connections, messages, apps you have ever installed, simply everything will be permanently removed. And here are the steps you take to set this option in your profile. From the top right of Facebook, click and select Settings. From the left menu, click Security. Click Legacy Contact. Click Have Your Account Permanently Deleted and follow the on-screen instructions. This is, however, only an initial step to remove your account. If something happens to you, Facebook still needs to be notified. Your immediate family member needs to contact Facebook to inform the social media giant about the loss. There's a special request for a deceased person's account where all the information, including a death certificate, needs to be sent. Only after that, will Facebook permanently remove your profile. Your second option is to set up a Facebook legacy contact. A legacy contact is a trusted person, a friend, or a family member that will make sure your profile is memorialized and taken care of after your death. According to Facebook, the legacy contact will be able to number one, write a post to display at the top of the memorialized timeline, for example, to announce a memorial service or share a special message. They can also respond to new friend requests from family members and friends who were not yet connected on Facebook. They can also update the profile picture and cover photo. They can archive your data only if you check this option in the settings. Photos and videos you upload, wall posts, profile and contact info events, and friends list. The following data can't be downloaded. Messages, ads you clicked, pokes, security and settings info. Photos you automatically synced but didn't post. Advice on how to set up a Facebook legacy contact. Select the person first and talk about it in advance. You can always change your selection and choose another person, but it is always better to discuss this responsibility in person ahead. It is also important to educate your legacy contact what to do. And here's how to add a Facebook legacy contact. Click in the top right of Facebook and select Settings. In the left menu, click Security, then click on Legacy Contact. Type in a friend's name and click Add. To let your friend know they are now your legacy contact, click Send. Your friend will be notified with the following message. What to do if you're appointed as a Facebook legacy contact. Respecting your deceased friend or family member is a responsibility. The first thing you will have to do is request memorialization of their profile. To do that, follow the link listed. Once it is set up as a memorial, the profile will receive the remembering label just above the name, next to the deceased person's profile picture. Memorialized profiles don't appear in public spaces, such as in suggestions for people you may know, ads, or birthday reminders. As a legacy contact, you can manage a profile in a limited way. To do so, you have to go to the bottom right of the profile's cover photo and select Manage. Then it's possible to add a pinned post to announce to the circle of the friends what has happened, respond to new friends' requests, change the profile picture and cover photo. This may not be a pleasant topic, but the older we get, the more important it becomes to set this up. It also takes a burden off those that are left to carry on after we are gone. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bob. Excellent advice. A little forethought will give uh, 
uh, our loved ones a lot easier time after we're gone, right? Correct. All right. Excellent. Uh, now, many of you know that um, you, I guess you you may be looking for a new printer. We're coming up to Black Friday. This is a printing topic. Uh, many of you know that I uh, participated in the Instant Ink program, uh, and I wanted to give you an update of just what's happening and my thoughts on it. So here's a short a short video on the uh, on the update. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Senior. You must watch this video before purchasing your next HP printer. Now in March of 2022, I wanted to evaluate the Instant Ink program that Hewlett Packard has. And I purchased a 6055E HP Envy printer for assessment. It is now seven months since I've been in the program and I wanted to give you an update of how things are going. Since Black Friday is coming up and many of you are considering purchasing a printer, I wanted to give you some important news about the Instant Ink program and some of the pitfalls you'll want to look at before you purchase an HP printer. So if you have an existing HP printer and are considering using the Instant Ink program, then that is certainly possible if you have a relatively new machine. I'll put the link below and you can go to the HP website and actually have a look and see if you have a compatible printer. If you do, then you can sign up for the Instant Ink program. The details of the program I'm not going to discuss today, that was done in the previous video I made, and I'll put the link below and up here so that you can watch that video. You may be considering an HP printer as a purchase consideration, so here's what is important for you to understand. When purchasing an Hewlett Packard printer, it is very important that you read the fine print. The Insta Ink program will be displayed on the box or the sales material. So here's what you need to look for. First of all, you may see that it is Instant Ink compatible, which is great. You can get Instant Ink. I think it's a good program and you should certainly consider it. That is Instant Ink compatible. The th second thing that you may find is that Instant Ink is included in the price of the purchase for a period of time. For example, you may see that it says that it is Instant Ink compatible and has included six months of Instant Ink for you. Well, this is reflected in the price of the machine. So if you decide that you do not want Instant Ink, maybe that you don't want the program, you don't want to give HP your credit card, you don't want them keeping track of how many pages you're using, then you would not want to purchase that printer because the price of that free ink they're giving you, well, not really free, is included in that price. The second thing that you may be looking for, and this was my case, is I got what we call HP+. Plus. Now, what is Hewlett Packard Plus or Instant Ink Plus? Well, this is an added benefit that you get, but again, this is baked into the price of the printer. And in my case, I got six months of free ink. Well, I'm not going to say it's free. It was included in the price. So when I signed up for the Instant Ink program, included in the price of the printer, was a promotional fee that I got for the first six months ink program, and that included the ink. And it even got better. For the first six months, I got up to 700 pages of, per month of printing, all included, all included in the price of the printer. I went racing upstairs to my wife and said, honey, we can print 700 pages a month and they're just going to keep sending us the ink. No charge. She looked at me and said, but we don't print anything. 
So that's a clue. If you don't print anything, do you really want to pay extra for HP Plus? It also extended the warranty on the printer by one year. So let's recap. You may just be wanting to use the Instant Ink program. You may have an existing printer and want to have all the advantages of the Instant Ink program. Fine. If you have a compatible printer, you can then sign up for the service. If you are looking to purchase a printer, you may find that the printer you're going to purchase is Instant Ink compatible, which is good. But you also may find in the price of that printer that Instant Ink is included, either for three months, six months, and in some cases up to two years of Instant Ink is included in the price of that printer. So you certainly would not want to not use two years of ink that you have already paid for. The third situation would be Instant Ink Plus. And again, for the first six months, you have an added bonus of all the ink that you can use, up to 700 pages. Again, you're paying for that, and that's included in the price of the printer, as you can see here in the printer that I purchased. All right, just an update on the uh, on the uh, uh, my Instant Ink uh, program. More to come. Huey, are you ready to roll? I definitely am. Identifying a hoax. I'm Huey Poplock. Today's topics, true or false article, and a real or a fake ad. Here's a typical Facebook post that I got uh, within the last couple of weeks. Don't forget tomorrow starts the new Facebook rule where they can use your photos. Don't forget the deadline is today. If you prefer, you can copy and paste this version. If you do not publish a statement at least once, it will be tacitly allowing the use of your photos as well as the information contained in the profile's status updates. Do not share, copy and paste. Their new algorithm chooses the same few people, about 25, who will read your posts. And then it continues. What I did is took one of the statements right at the beginning and I, I highlighted it. I copy and pasted it into the Google search. If you don't get an answer that you would like, you should put quotes around the entire statement. And as soon as I did, the top one is Snopes.com. Snopes.com is one of the major hoax reporting sites on the web. And this is what they said about that. Does a new Facebook rule about the use of photos start tomorrow? Don't forget tomorrow starts the new Facebook rule, they say right at the top. And this was published just a few months ago in June. This is false, according to Snow. Fact check. Don't forget tomorrow starts the new Facebook rule. This was the way a virtually shared post was copy and pasted in June of 22 and also in the last couple of weeks that I posted it, and in the months before. It claimed that the deadline for this supposed rule change was today. Good news for Facebook users was that none of this is true. It's been making the rounds in one form or another for at least a decade. Here's another article that one of my friends posted. It's official, signed at 714. It's even passed on TV. Facebook will start charging this summer. If you copy this to your wall, your icon will turn blue and your Facebook will be free for you. Please pass this message. If not, your icon will be deleted. P.S. This is serious and the icon will turn blue. Copy and paste to your wall. And again, Snope says they found that article and it says it's false. The post claimed the news had even been broadcast on TV. However, this is nothing more than a repeated iteration of a long-running Facebook hoax. To be clear, Meta has never announced any plans to charge Facebook users money in order for them to be able to use the platform. All right, now what about a Facebook ad? Here was an ad that appeared in my Facebook a couple of weeks ago. It's a transformer remote control folding scooter and there's free shipping on it 
but it's $46.98. And I looked this through and through. I looked at the pictures, but for less than $50, doesn't make sense. So I did some searching, and I did the searching on Transformer Remote Control Folding Scooter. Guess what I did? I found it on Amazon for $2,775, not less than 50. So one of the things that I do when I see one of those ads, and I see them very often of products that should be much more expensive, very cheap. I go to scamadvisor.com and I put in the name of the URL for the website that is selling the product. And I did that for this particular one, and it gave me a trust score of 1 out of 100. In other words, it's a scam. Now, why do posts on Facebook ask you to copy and paste? The original poster wants you to copy and paste to get the message as far and wide as possible. But these original posts often do not come from people like you and me. They come from people who have an agenda. If they can get you to copy and paste, they significantly extend the reach of the post. So why not be a good Facebook friend and do as you're asked? Why shouldn't you copy and post this to your own timeline? Well, there are several reasons. One, by creating a new fresh post with copy and paste uh, versus share, you've created another occurrence that Facebook has to track. This process creates a new unique instance of the post. It's harder for Facebook or the original poster to remove the message when it's copy and pasted as unique posts. Number two, the message language can be searched and scammers can find all of the people who posted it. This lets scammers or others know people are open to the message that was posted. Try it. Copy a few lines of that post and paste it into Google search and see what happens. Three, it circumvents your privacy settings. If the original poster set privacy for friends only, then the people who share that post cannot share past the original poster's friends list. This severely limits the post's ability to go viral. Let's say the original poster had 300 friends. That is the limit of the post reach with a share, but with a copy-paste, the number of people to see that post is limited. If a message is deemed inappropriate by Facebook, they can easily remove one instance, the original post, and all shared posts will be removed. When you copy and paste, if you circumvent that process and make it harder for Facebook to police content. You expose yourself to scammers who may want to target you for your sympathies to cancer, dogs, and whatever. You support an original poster you likely don't know. Therefore, it's best not to copy and paste Facebook posts, no matter how much you like that friend or that message. Always check whether an article is true or a hoax before sharing or reposting. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Identifying a hoax, I'm Huey Poplock. Thank you, Huey. Good advice. Um, all right, Ray, just before we get going, uh, mm -hmm. thank you those of you who uh, are over on our YouTube feed. We'll be stopping the, uh, stopping the show for you now. If you want to pop over and participate in the Q&A, uh, We've got lots of room. Just come on over to our Zoom meeting and we'll see you again next week. Ray, take it away. all about that Megan Trainer. You can probably count on one hand uh, the contemporary singers of today where I've actually spent my hard-earned money and purchased their music, either as a download, a CD, or an LP. Adele would be on that list, as well as Bruno Mars of a few years ago. 
But there's even a younger singer where I was glad I purchased her LP. She hit the music scene in a major way in 2014 with a number one single on Billboard's Hot 100 titled All About That Bass, as well as receiving the 2016 Grammy Award for Best New Artist. That would be Megan Trainer. She was born in 1993, raised in Nantucket, Massachusetts, with a musically oriented family, specifically her father, Gary. He was a fan of 1950s music, including doo-wop, jazz, and James Brown. As a songwriter, she says a major influence were the songs of Frank Sinatra. And as a musician, she plays the guitar, ukulele, piano, trumpet, and piano. Now, before achieving the fame associated with all that bass, more specifically between the ages of 15 to 17, she released her on her own three albums where she had written and recorded all the songs in a recording studio in her parents' home. From a technology perspective, and this is what impressed me, she did the recordings using the digital audio software GarageBand that was developed by Apple Inc. And later she used another Apple product, Logic Studio, which at the time was said to contain the largest collection of sampler instruments, effects plugins, and audio loops. Now I have the songs from two of these albums in my collection, with my favorite being Take Care of Our Soldiers, where all the proceeds benefited the USO and the Cape Cod Cares for Our Troops organization. Now, Trainer's Epic Records debut in 2014 was with the EP with the title, Title. This was followed by a full album of songs with the same title. Now, on a side note, I love that in today's music world, the category EP or extended play is used when an artist doesn't have enough material for a complete album, perhaps only four or five songs. Most of us are old enough to remember 45 RPM EP records with two songs on each side that often came with a colorful cardboard sleeve similar to an LP. Now in 2015, she suffered from a vocal cord hemorrhage and it forced her to cancel planned tour stops at the time, but thankfully the following surgery, she was able to fully recover. Not too long after that, Megan met her future husband, and in February 2021, she gave birth to a son. So I took my grandson and stepdaughter to see her in concert in 2017 when she was in Phoenix. I was surprised to see in attendance at this stage show so many very young girls who obviously adore Trainer, even if they were too young to fully understand and appreciate the lyrics of her songs. It's worth noting that in 2015, the song All About That Bass was the only debut single by any artist to accumulate a billion, that's billion with a B, views on YouTube. Now Megan Trainer has a brand new album title, Taking It Back, and she appeared earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, on the Today Show, where she sang songs from the new release. Today's clip is the song, Bad For Me. Megan Trainer. Thanks, Ray. That was great. Wow. Um, all right, question and answer. We're going to get into that in just a second. I want to thank everyone for, if you have to leave, thank you for coming. We will be uh, we'll be here uh, next week, same time, same place. I just wanted to announce in December, we have Chris Gould coming from Geeks on Tour, going to talk about how to take pictures with your digital camera. This will be an exciting program, and that will be uh, in December next month. So if you have... Um, and as far as our premier service to go today, I put the link in the uh, chat a couple of times. Remember, we have cars and trucks with uh, Dewey Cluse. I'm talking about saving your precious moments. And Huey's talking on files and formats, and that'll all be at half past the hour. Don't forget our show on Monday. We have, uh, or th Thursday, we have, of course, Tech for Senior Live on Thursday, and we'll be, uh, the usual gang will be there this Thursday, and we'll have another another uh, uh, great time over a cup of coffee and enjoyable hour to spend. So if you want to spend your Thursday morning with us, uh, please come and see us. All right, uh, let's get on with the questions. And I see, of course, Carl has the first question. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, I have a question to see for um Huey or Bob, I have uh, keep getting alerts of birthdays of uh, friends on Facebook who have been deceased for years. 
And how do you alert uh, Facebook? And I'm not a relative. There's some of them. I just have been in my you know clubs I belong to. Uh, how do you how do you notify them to quit that they're deceased? I've got to shut off my egg cooker in the back. It means they didn't have a legacy arrangement set up. That's why you're still getting the announcements. And the, the way to uh, stop that. Uh, on your part would be to unfriend them. Right. All right. I always feel guilty when I unfriend somebody who's passed on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you get that, Carl? Unfriend them. Yeah, that's that's great information. Thank you. And good presentation on both uh, Bob and Huey on uh, the uh, social media. Yeah, I keep harping to people about uh, don't copy and paste those things and don't and, and do check to see if they're they're real or not and and friends keep posting them and keep doing it over and over again and I I caution them about it and, and another one will do it or sometimes they even do it again so in my, uh, in my presentation one of the things I harped on was you can create a bad reputation without ever posting a single word and that's just exactly what you do when you pass along all bad information from others yep exactly but by, by by the way i'm uh gonna live in mortality i don't want my face to go away on facebook <laughs> and right. by the way i joined facebook about 15 years ago when i had hair and uh it's still the same photo i only put one photo on there you go there you go uh dorothy go ahead uh i just wanted to thank you for all the great presentations today about the car because i'm looking at the ph TV and um, I'm assuming Bob and Huey's presentation will have separate YouTubes that I can share on my Facebook page. Yeah, they're already. I they'd probably already be up. Oh, they're already okay. on their channels. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in terms of um, the legacy and Facebook thing, um, my brother and I are trying to deal with my father's two Facebook accounts that his wife made, and they are still there. And uh, there's a bit of a process to do all that in terms of. Uh, you need a death certificate, and there's a lot of paperwork to do that. So just to let you know that whoever is an executor and the account didn't get the legacy information, it's a bit of work. It is. You know, it's it's amazing. You know, you can imagine what's going to happen in another ten years. How much how much information is going to be on on you know on in the cloud? of people that are no longer there. I mean, somewhere, someone, you know, and Google's going to have all those Gmail accounts, all those stuff that, that nobody's ever canceled. And I don't know what we're going to do. It's not, maybe we'll have to have a, we're going to restart now sort of switch uh, and, and turn that switch. I don't know. It's going to be very interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people just say, well, I don't care. I'm going to be dead. Well, right. I care because I don't want all that those accounts and everything to be out there, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, the other thing, Dorothy, that you have to think about is also uh, some of those people may have extensive uh, um, picture libraries, such as uh, yeah, know. You know, Google Photos. And that yeah. may be historically something that, that people want to keep or those pictures are important. And so yeah. you've got to figure out what to do with them. Yeah, like I can go into my dad's accounts and I can download all his photos and before I start the process to get it deleted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions? Um, any other questions or comments on the show today? Uh, Kathleen, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was just wondering with, I missed his beginning of the text and who who was the other person in addition to Adele that you would say that you would purchase today? You're muted, Ray. Uh, I mentioned Bruno Mars was one of a few years ago when he was with his uh, a band called the Hooligans, but uh, he's moved on to working with a, another gentleman now, whose name I don't remember, and it's a different style of music. Adele and you know, I, I said Adele, but no, I, Megan Trainer. Uh, is, is really a, a talented young lady and I really felt today I needed to after doing three weeks of people who died I, I needed to have somebody who was uh, alive <laughs> and well and on her way up yeah, I, I, I never heard of her and she was wonderful I'll look her up again thank you right, she was right in New York City 
where where she performed. Yeah. Okay. Jim, did you have a question or comment? <clears throat> Great show today, guys. It was I really especially like the electric vehicle uh, video that was that was great to see and uh, Bob and Huey you both had some really good stuff on there and then you too Ron I mean, <laughs> so yeah Chris is looking forward to doing the presentation yeah we're excited so uh, so that'll be in December we'll all talk to her about which day we'll pick a date and uh, and that should be fun I really enjoyed um, I don't know if everyone saw uh your show on monday but i really enjoyed the light box i thought that was such a hoot when you when you showed the video about how to make a light box out of your pc and uh, i thought that was just such a great uh oper great idea oh well, yeah there's there's yeah. all you know Especially turning it upside down, right? I know that was, just, <laughs> that was just crazy. We'll have to maybe we should play that some on one of our you know this show. But it's uh, it's That's really cool. Okay. If you have slides, old slides that you we were talking about what to do with old slides, and if you you know if you have um, if you if you're looking at the slides and you're holding them up, thinking oh, what's in this slide. One of the things you can have is a light box which is uh, something where you put the slides on top and you can see because light comes up from underneath. So a couple of suggestions were, is if you have a tablet, just open open up um, uh, one of the word processing problems on there and then blank it out so it's just a blank page and then you can lay the tablet down. And if you have a, a laptop, well, then, of course, if if it's if you can turn it into a tablet, then that works. But if you don't have a tablet or, or the laptop doesn't fold, you can turn it upside down and do it. <laughs> so it so then the, the screen's on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I thought that was that was a really good idea. Great. Good. Good stuff. Excellent. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I will say goodbye to everybody. Uh, don't forget, we have a show on Thursday and also our premiere service will start in, uh, I guess, about uh, a little over 15 minutes from now. Please uh, enjoy that. It'll, of course, uh, once it's played, it's, it's there available for you. Um, and you can watch it um, over and over again. And we'll see everybody in another week for another great show. Thanks for coming and uh, enjoy your day. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.